Track one. The internet is full of articles about what makes a good boy band, but many bands appear and disappear without a trace. Alana, it can't be as easy as following a formula, can it? <laughs> no, I don't think so. The traditional formula is that you have four or five good-looking young guys with some musical ability and the ability to dance. The choreographed dancing was very important to boy bands in the past. They tended to wear the same or very similar clothes when they performed, so you had to decide on a look for the group.、Mm. The most important element, however, was said to be that the band members had different and very distinct personalities. Right, the cute one, the rebel,、mm. the joker, the shy one, mysterious one. <laughs> yeah, although sometimes they all just seem like the cute one. <laughs> the idea is that different boys appeal to different girls, so you can have a bigger fan base. There's someone in the band for everyone.、Ah, so, do you think this all still holds true, or have things changed in the 21st century? Yeah, I guess things have changed for several reasons. Partly just because we needed a change, but mainly because of changes in the media and with new technology. Take One Direction. Ah, I've been counting the seconds before you mentioned One Direction. <laughs> well. We have to talk about them because they're the biggest thing at the moment. Although, who knows how long they will last? Oh, ages and ages. <laughs> we'll see. Anyway, One Direction, as you know, came to fame through the X Factor, a reality show,、mm. and that was a great way to start. You had loads of people watching them every week and wanting them to win. They felt as if they had a personal stake in their story as they voted for them every week.、Mm. What age group does One Direction appeal to exactly? Well, that's another clever thing. They seem very unthreatening, so they appeal to very young girls. They are cute, so teenage girls really like them. But they also have a laddish, slightly naughty side to appeal to the mums. <laughs> the teenage girls and the mums are the ones who will spend the money.、Mm. The lyrics to the songs are calculated to appeal to girls who feel a bit insecure about themselves, like most teenage girls.、Oh. You don't know you're beautiful. That's what makes you beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> That kind of thing. Lots of girls want to feel wanted, but not scared, and that's traditionally what boy bands do. They present this image of a clean-cut, reliable boyfriend. Actually, One Direction's clothes also help here: chinos and clean, casual shirts and canvas shoes.、Mm. You'll have noticed that they don't wear the same clothes. Their stylists have been instructed to keep them looking individual, but despite that. They all have this attractive but unthreatening look.、Oh. No tattoos or piercings or black leather or makeup or anything. <laughs> you make them seem very cold and calculating. Remember that they've been nominated for loads of music awards and they've won dozens. So they're regarded as serious musicians. <laughs> okay, if you don't want to believe they're calculating, you can blame their management. <laughs> they're nice boys. Who are fantastic musicians? They are, and they keep proving their critics wrong. A lot of people said they wouldn't make the leap from the UK to the US market, but they did very quickly. Yes, and that's all down to their clever use of social media, or rather, their management's clever use of social media.、Mm. One Direction are all over Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Tumblr. That's how they made it in the states so quickly.、Ah. In the past, it was a lot more difficult and took a lot longer. Bands had to try and get airtime on local radio stations, and that was really hard. But they've bypassed all that. Social media has become the new radio, as their manager said.、Mm. Their first record, "Up All Night," went to number one in the U.S., didn't it? <laughs> sure did. They achieved a world record as the first British band in history to reach number one in America with a debut album. 
It sold 176,000 copies in the US in a single week. <laughs> Amazing. And the boys are all rich from the merchandising too. Yes. Well, the boys and their management company, there are One Direction phones, toys and games, dolls even. <laughs> I think that's another 21st century thing. Companies are cashing in on success in all possible ways as quickly as possible. <laughs> May they all enjoy it while it lasts. Track two. Today, we're going to talk about names, particularly fashions in names, you know, the kind of names famous people use for their children. You've been looking into this recently, haven't you, Finn? I have indeed, and it's a fascinating topic. The US leads here with new names, and we in Britain follow sometimes, but we tend to go for the more traditional names. So, the big trend is using nouns as names. Nouns? What sort of nouns? <laughs> well, they can be abstract qualities like honour or passion. There's a long tradition of this kind of name, like faith or charity, which used to be common names. A new name is Haven that's growing in popularity. <laughs> and similar names like shelter, harbour and bay also convey feelings of safety and warmth. Mm. I suppose passion is used to mean extreme enthusiasm nowadays. Hmm. And people use the word a lot, so maybe it's a good choice for a modern name. Haven has a nice safe feel to it. <laughs> OK, then there are names which come from nature or animals. Although with some of these, it's hard to know whether they come from nature or a surname. Mm. That's another trend. Here we have frost, wolf, fox, bear, for boys, of course. <laughs> and a new name, ridge. Ridge, like a mountain ridge. The top of a mountain range. Yes, weird, huh? <laughs> it's seen as a tough, outdoorsy name for a boy. <laughs> OK, then there are musical names. Harmony and melody have been around for ages, but lyric is a new one. Lyric, wow. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it came in at number 325 in the US a couple of years ago. That doesn't sound very popular, but there are so many different names being used at the moment that it means it isn't so unusual. Other noun categories are months. May, June and April are common, mm -hmm. but January is uncommon and November very unusual. <laughs> and then you have colours. Beyonce and Jay-Z called their daughter Blue Ivy, a very distinctive name, a colour plus the name of a plant. Blue is very popular for girls right now, and red or grey for boys. I've just thought of another category, food names, like olive or clementine. Yes, that's another one. Flower names are pretty common, but food names are unusual. Uh, Gwyneth Paltrow and Chris Martin named their daughter Apple, of course. Yes, poor child. <laughs> Actually, Apple is becoming more and more popular, although people think that's because of the technology connection, mm. not the fruit. <laughs> <laughs> New names always seem strange at first, but you quickly get used to them, like all the names from places or jobs. Chelsea and Brooklyn seem like normal names now. They were strange when they were first used. Taylor, Mason, Cooper are all first names from jobs. And they are also surnames. I think that's how they started. Mm, you're probably right there. What about the Beckham's daughter, Harper? Mm. She was named after Harper Lee, the American novelist who wrote To Kill a Mockingbird. Oh. That's another trend, naming children after famous writers, musicians. Uh, the British band One Direction have had an effect on names. Or fictional characters like Bella or Edward from the Twilight series. Or Hermione from Harry Potter. Sorry, can I just interrupt there? Mm -hmm. I've just had a message passed on by the producer. A listener has just phoned in with a very strange story about a family in Holland with six children. Mm. Their names are all 
anagrams of the letters A, E, L and X. Ah, yes. I've heard about this. <laughs> <laughs> this family are famous in the world of bloggers on names. Uh, let me see if I remember the names. Alex mm. and Axel so. <laughs> and Lexa. They're the easy ones. Mm -hmm. uh, Zila and Zael. <laughs> And the last one is zeal. Oh, I'm guessing about the pronunciations, by the way. You mean there are names X-E-L-A and X-A-E-L? <laughs> yes, but they are very unusual. I think the Dutch family are stopping at six children, but there are about 18 more possible anagrams they could use. No, you're kidding. <laughs> all seem horrible to me, but all are possible names. <laughs> This is similar to another trend of giving children names all starting with the same letter, like the Kardashian family, all beginning with K, oh. Kim, Courtney and so on. Well, the Kardashians have had enough publicity. Let's not talk about them. <laughs> what about your name, Finn? That sounds like a good Irish name. Oh, yes. Track three. For thousands of years, the Maasai people in Kenya had no doubts about their relationship with the lions who shared the land with them. They were enemies. The lions wanted to kill the tribe's livestock, and the Maasai had to protect the animals. It was even part of the coming-of-age ritual of the young warriors to kill a lion. But now things have changed, and the Maasai are part of a new East African scheme to protect lions – called the Lion Guardians. The aim is for local people to be trained to manage and protect the lions without involvement from outsiders after the period of initial training. The Lion Guardians are taught basic literacy, how to manage data, how to deal with the conflict between humans and lions, GPS and telemetry tracking of radio-collared lions. Some of them also learn how to speak in public and how to blog. The lion guardians monitor the lions and other carnivores and inform cattle herders when to avoid the areas where there are lions. They also help improve the livestock enclosures and educate people about wildlife. Helping find lost livestock is another important job. In the past, these would often have been killed by carnivores. If anyone is about to carry out a lion hunt, the lion guardians try and persuade them not to. Since many of the guardians have killed lions in the past and are very experienced, they are highly respected in the community and are listened to by their age mates or peers, and often by their elders. They explain the importance of the lions to culture and tourism and how they can now be arrested for killing the protected animals. One such lion guardian is Alubi Leirumbe. He has killed seven lions in his lifetime. The last one was a lioness who was pregnant with five cubs. He regretted killing her very much had a massive change of heart and volunteered to become a lion guardian. Alubi's father used to hate lions and encouraged his sons to hunt them. But since Alubi became a guardian, he has been advising them not to kill carnivores. Alubi was recently interviewed by Sir David Attenborough and appeared on the Africa documentary series. Another guardian... Mingati Makarot, is very good at tracking lions using his traditional skills and has a great knowledge of the area that acts as a refuge to many wildlife species. Mingati is a past lion killer but has completely converted to being one of its ardent protectors. His name, Mingati, is a lion name, given to him meaning one who is fast and doesn't lag behind. In the past, a Moran, a Maasai warrior, received a lion name after spearing a lion. In Maasai culture, 
the name represents the characteristics of both the warrior and the lion he has killed. A warrior with a lion name feels that he has achieved something great. When the successful warrior brings the lion's mane and tail back to his manyatta, his home in the community, to be put on display, he is treated as a hero. Other young men, who don't yet have their lion names, are called by the general name of Moran. They long to have recognition and dream about the day that it will be their turn to bring home the lion trophy. Now, this naming tradition is changing. The lion guardians experimented by giving lion names to boys who had not killed lions. And it worked. Other young people called them by the lion names. Then the older people did so too. There were still some boys who wanted to do something to prove their bravery, and they were assigned conservation tasks to do. Now young men can earn respect by protecting lions rather than killing them. Another change is that the lions are now given Maasai names, and each has a card explaining who the lion is related to and which lions they keep company with. Personalising the lions helps them to be seen as individuals by the community. Since the programme began in 2007, no lions have been killed in the area patrolled by lion guardians. Compare that to a similar neighbouring area without guardians, where 63 have been killed, and you can see just how successful the scheme is. The Maasai have managed to successfully adapt their culture to changing times without giving up their identity. Track 4 A. It was Nicky's idea, but we all think it's going to be brilliant. As soon as the last exams are finished, we're going to decorate the main hall at school with paper streamers and Chinese lanterns and things. Steve had this idea of projecting photos of everyone onto a wall, like a slideshow. And we've got Joe's brother, who's a professional DJ, coming along. Then there are three different bands lined up to play. Ours is the best, because we've been together the longest. And we've got a great bass player. <coughs> Although I say so myself. <laughs> so, we're on last. It's going to be cool. B. Every year there's a carnival in August in London. You've probably heard of it. The Notting Hill Carnival. So this year me and my friends are going again. We went last year and we had such a fantastic time. It's all Afro-Caribbean with people in amazing costumes and these brilliant steel bands. We don't go in costume, but we do dance a lot. It does get quite crowded, so you have to make sure you stick together. And you have to watch out for pickpockets when there are so many people in the same place. But it's really good fun. It's like London becomes a different country. Even the police dance sometimes. C. We're going to hire a boat for the day and take it up the river. It's my grandparents' golden wedding anniversary, so the whole family is getting together. I'm really looking forward to seeing my cousins again. I haven't seen them for ages. We've got this huge picnic planned with loads of different types of sandwiches and salads and an enormous cake. My dad has borrowed an ancient gramophone player, you know, what they had before CD players and some old records. So as we go up the river, we're going to listen to music from the time my grandparents got married, the swinging 60s. D. Two of my best friends have their birthday in the same week, so some of us have decided to have a surprise party for both of them. One of my friends, Sandra, has a big house and her parents say we can use it. They're going away, luckily. It's at the end of October, so we're going to decorate the house with Halloween things, you know, spiders' webs and spooky things. 
We're going to make up an excuse to get the birthday girls to come round to the house. Say we're going to help Sandra move some stuff or something. Then, as soon as Sandra lets them in, we're going to turn the lights out and jump out at them. We just have to make sure nobody mentions anything on Facebook and gives away the surprise. E. There's a royal wedding in June. One of our princes is getting married, so it's a public holiday. Lots of people are having parties in squares and parks and places, and the people in our street decided to have one too. Well, it's a good excuse to have a party, isn't it? We're all going to take out tables and chairs and put them together in the middle of the road. We're going to stop cars coming through, obviously. We're all going to bring different dishes and share them round. There are quite a lot of different nationalities living on our street. People from India, China and different African countries. So the food should be really interesting. It'll be good to get to know more of the neighbours too.